The number one thing when they talk about starting a business, and I'm going to talk about some business concepts that I believe, because I think a lot of the stuff that you learn in school is dead wrong. And then I'm going to talk specifically about a recession. Uh, to back it up a little bit, last year we did 2.5 million. We ended the year around 25 people. Uh, our net was a little bit less than 100 grand. You have to grow or you go out of business. Um, this year we're in the 30s and we're tracking right now a little bit over, uh, hopefully a little bit over 3 million. So, and again, we expect to be profitable, but this year it's going to be a little bit more narrow because um, this year we have a little problem with a lot of our clients paying their bills, and I think some of that's beyond their control, but bad debt, I think some of you guys are seeing that as well. So going back to starting a business. I didn't get my back row. The number one thing to do when you start a business is go sell something. All these MBA programs and these, you know, write your business plan and all the other stuff, is for the most part, in my opinion, a bunch of baloney. Go sell something, even if you don't have it. Go sell it and then build it. Um, when I started the company, I sold one website for $8,600 and I was trying to sell another one and I couldn't. And a secretary is working for this uh, gentleman says, my printer doesn't work. And I'm like, I do printers. Um, and we just, and then I installed a fiber optic network. We pretty much did anything we could uh, to get through when times are tough, because in, in that period, of t going into 2001, there was a recession right there. So first thing is go sell something. I'm not saying you shouldn't do a business plan, but I would do it later after you figure out and you've talked to the market. The next thing is what is the goal of business? Profit. To make profit. You would be surprised how many job applicants come into my office and can't answer that question. I get the most politically correct bunch of baloney. I get, oh, it's to provide services for the betterment of mankind, or it's, I get all this wacky stuff, provide jobs, you know. Uh, but nobody will just say that, I mean, let's be honest, a, a company is a cold-hearted piece of paper that's just sitting there. It doesn't have any ethics. It doesn't have any entity. It's just a piece of paper. It is what the leadership brings to it uh, that turns a company from a piece of paper into something uh, a value, hopefully, and something that has a social standing. But make sure you focus on that, because I didn't when I originally started. And I was running a very thin margin. In 2001, the tech recession hit. Uh, I managed to lose $75,000 that year, which is a neat trick since I started the company on $7,000. Um, the way you do that, by the way, is you second mortgage your house, and uh, you lose all that money, and then you talk to your family, and then they sell a house that I don't know, since 1976, they give you all that money and then you lose all that money and you get your checking account down to $2,000 and six employees um, and then you turn it around. And the way we did that was we started to obsess over increasing the profitability of our clients. That is all we think about, is we want to increase their profitability. We make it real easy to leave month to month. It's easy to export your data, you can come in, but the obsession is over results. Now, that's hard because it means my designers are never, ever going to win an Addy Award. Because Addy Awards are won by commissioned Picassos. For those of you who aren't familiar with Addy, it's in the American Advertising Federation. They give them for pretty looking uh, commercials that don't necessarily produce results. And again, I, I, you know, the, land, the air, airplane got awful low. So the first thing we did was we studied it. And for those of you who, there's some research on this you can look up. But basically, the web responds like direct marketing. So if you grab a good direct marketing letter, you're going to find uh, everything you need to know about how to make a good website. Not a pretty website, but, but a good website. Let me back up on one more thing, academics. If you think about academics, it's backwards. It is one of the reasons I don't like hiring people right out of school. Uh, in order for you to get an A, you have to get a B, you have to get a C, you have to get a D, right? And if you guys collaborate, what's that called? It's cheating, right? It's exactly the opposite of what you do in a successful business. So academics does a terrible job of preparing our people to either start or prepare or participate in a business. And this matters, and we'll come up to that in a little bit. Is that going to balance? All right. Next thing is a self-made man. And these are a lot of just the pet peeves, but I want to make sure you guys realize that every time you hear a story about a self-made man, every time you hear the story of Jeff Bezos and his wife getting in their car,
driving across while he was in the back writing the business plan and she's driving and, and they, that's how they started the business. That, that's not exactly how it went down. I bet if you talk to Jeff, uh, he's going to tell you about all the different people who helped him. I have had so much help from friends and from family and from all these people. I have not once met what I would consider what the media represents to you as a self-made man. So that's another question is, uh, if you're going to get through the recession, don't be afraid to ask for the business. Don't be afraid to ask for help because, by God, you're going to need it. I mean, you really are. Um, I did go out in the hall and start screaming to get some of you guys in here because you know what that is? That's asking for the business. And if you don't ask for it, you're not going to get it. So part of it is a little bit more aggressive and extroverted, particularly in a recession. Forgiveness. Believe it or not, um, i got to walk. Forgiveness is one of the most profitable things you can do in business. Uh, it is weird how it works, but you will have employees who leave after six months. Another one leaves after seven months. Um, and you figure you lost maybe 20 grand of training on each one. So $40,000 walks out the door. And you're, you're, you're probably not happy about this, right? But if you don't absolutely positively forgive them completely and entirely, then it, it eats at your profitability in ways. And I can't prove the linear relationship, but I've seen many an entrepreneur who are they're just angry. And you can look at them and you know their business will fail. Now, I don't. And I can't prove this correlation. But I promise you, if there's one way you want to improve your profitability, is improve your ability to forgive. Actually, is Brian Potter in the room? Yeah, OK, one of the weirdest interview questions I got was from this guy. I, I was sitting there, and I was talking about this ex-business partner who completely screwed me over, man. Ah, oh, lawsuits, everything. And um, so I tell him the story of this, and he goes, well, have you forgiven him? And I'm like, first, that's the weirdest question I've had in an interview in a long time. I felt like I was on an Arlo Guthrie record or something, you know? Uh, and, and I realize the answer to that is no. No, I haven't. Uh, but I think pretty much all the other ones I have. And I'm working on that last one. I, I'm going to have to, to rise up. But again, they don't teach you that in business school. The ability to forgive clients when they don't pay their bills, uh, the ability to forgive employees, it, it is huge on keeping you sane. Um, also, if you ever like, want to borrow 20 bucks, completely borrow it from me because I will not remember that. I mean, I will completely forget it, man. I mean, seriously, I cannot tell you how many times somebody walks up and goes, oh, here's that five. I'm like, what? You know, and, and again, it's, I don't know if that's forgiveness or, or conscious forgetfulness, but I do know that it prevents me from ever holding that against somebody and saying, hey, they owe me 20 bucks. They didn't pay me back. So forgiveness is huge. Now let me give you something to forgive people for. You guys familiar with the phrase schadenfreude? It's uh, enjoying the misery of others. And here's the problem with that. When you run a business, at some point, everybody, everybody, your loved ones, your kids, your spouse, your parents, at some point, you're going to look into their eyes and you're going to see that at that moment, it may be just for a millisecond, but at that moment, they want to see you fail. Who the hell are you to think you can fly when everyone else is crashing? And when you see that in their eye, it hurts. It really hurts. But you, again, this goes back to the forgiveness thing. And you got to realize it's human nature. Because what they're saying is, look, you're the cliff diver. You jumped off the cliff. And I think that's amazing on the other hand. But the other part is like, well, who said you could be a cliff diver? Who said that you could, uh, who said that you could do that? Where do you have the gall to go and jump? And so it's weird because you actually have people in your life who are undercutting you consciously. Or not, I'm sorry, subconsciously. And you've got to work through that. And you've got to accept it. And you have to completely... Forgive, but I really wish somebody explained that to me. And I did say the moment. It's not permanent. It's just something that'll happen for one day or one moment. But the problem is, as an entrepreneur, when you put your heart and soul into it, it hurts, right? It hurts. Um, and you got to forgive. All right, what is the worst thing in American society you can say about somebody? I don't, like, what's the worst thing you can say? You don't have to say it. You can innuendo it. <laughs> right? I mean, you're probably, you're probably thinking MF, right? That's what you're thinking. That's, that's what you're going to say to somebody. Or just F you, you're going to say that. And it's not. The absolute worst thing you can say in our culture is to call somebody a loser. Think about that. It takes 17 years to become a United States citizen, at least, based on what I've seen. 
That means in order to get here, we pretty much have weed, weeded out anybody who's going to do it legally. Right? I mean, I know my ancestors came over as indentured servants on boats and worked and everything else. But in order to come to our country, you have to be willing to ignore our laws. That's kind of weird. And what's that self-selected group? It's a bunch of hyper-aggressive people, right? So in America, we are faced with a slightly different uh, culture. And we do tolerate failure much higher. There's a lot, much lower incidence of entrepreneurship in Japan because if they fail there, it, it is, it's a shame on their family and they may not be able to get another job. If you fail as an entrepreneur here, is that the end of the world? No, I mean, everyone's gonna tell you to get back up and do it again. Um, which explains why the, you know, the suicide rate for entrepreneurs, which by the way, that's something else they don't tell you, uh, is significantly higher in all cultures. But in Japan, um, hey, I said I was gonna talk about some sacred cows nobody would talk about, all right? Um, and Japan is significantly higher for people who have failed because, again, they, they not only can the culture not forgive them, but they have trouble forgiving themselves, and they definitely have trouble picking themselves back up and doing it. They also say that 95% of small businesses fail within the first five years, right? All right, but you know the, the saying by Disraeli, you know, there's lies, damn lies, and statistics. Here's the thing: if 95% of small businesses fail, I can't prove it. But I bet it's the same 1% of the people who are too dumb to figure out they can't get this thing working who just keep trying over and over and over, right? So, I mean, this was my fifth business. That means I managed to screw up four times. Um, and I've almost taken this one out twice. Uh, and one of those times being this year. I thought the recession was over, committed everything, spent 40 grand on training the first quarter. A whole theme for the year was go big or go home. Uh, yeah, it turned out with a bunch of bad debt and the recession not ending, that was a pretty stupid thing for me to do. Um, but that is my nature, and that also needs to be your nature if you are going to uh, survive and run profitably. And I'm going to tell you how to get to those things. All right, three rules of business. Another thing I wish somebody told me, because this would have prevented my first problem. There are, uh, the, the anecdote goes that uh, a man goes into a room, and he finds himself in a room with three billionaires. And he's talking to the billionaires, and he says, look, what?" You know, what is it? I, I know a lot of rich people, but you guys are billionaires. What, what are you doing differently? And they, they say, look, there's only three things you have to do. Is one, you have to sell at a profit. You cannot sell at a loss and make it up in volume. You have to sell at a profit. Uh, you can have Coke at the front as a loss leader, but that client who tells you, do our site, we'll send you a bunch of referrals. Has that ever worked out for anybody? Anybody? No, no, it never works out. It never works out, so you must sell at a profit. Now, I, when I started the business, gave away free websites because I needed a portfolio. But once they value your services at zero, they will never come back because they will always value your services at zero. So do it for free, consider it a portfolio piece, and then delete them from your phone book. Just move on down the road. But you have to sell at a profit. The second thing is, uh, to a large extent, business is a younger man's game. It takes incredible stamina and health just to get up every day. I have been doing this 14 years, um, and the standards to which I am held are amazingly strict. Um, I was five minutes late uh, to a meeting yesterday. Somebody was proactively moved the meeting, and within three minutes of the meeting being moved, I had an angry email from one of my managers saying, you know, what are you doing? So the, the, the standards that you're held to, you've got to, to really be above it. And to do that, you have to have uh, stamina. That's the second rule, is you have to love what you do. Because the only way you're going to get that stamina is by loving what you do. So if you went into business uh, selling you know, peanuts, but you don't really care about peanuts, those are the guys who flip the companies, right? They, they love what they do. They start companies. All right? That's not loving peanuts. That's a whole different thing. If you love peanuts, you become a peanut farmer, right? Well, I love the web, sociology, and people, so that's given me the stamina of the last 14 years. So you have to sell at a profit, you have to love what you do. I was doing those things, and I still almost went out of business because I didn't do the third rule. The third rule is you have to have a recurring revenue model. It takes too much energy to close a sale and do business with somebody. You just cannot earn that business over and over. You must have a recurring revenue model, and that is where we change. So. Our software is not as cool or as popular as Dries is, and I see him over there, so I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say our numbers comparatively. Um, but uh, we've got about 400 sites, and Tendency brings in over a million dollars a year for us. And that's on software I started writing 
like Dream, so the software is literally 10 years old. Um, now, what we did in the recession was we doubled down. And what I mean by that was two and a half years ago, we decided that we were going to rewrite our software from scratch. Now, what this did was it set us up for success in the future, right? Because we're talking about how to profitably get through a recession. We had a recurring revenue. And you know what the clients saw? They saw our software stagnate. What they saw was no changes to our software or very few changes for two and a half years. And I was getting calls like, Ed, are you asleep at the wheel? What the hell are you doing? You don't have Ajax on this page and everything else. And I've got to say, well, I took all five programmers and I bet everything on this new technology. And we're rewriting all of it in Django, Python, uh, and in Amazon Cloud, and uh, in fact, Eloy, and hopefully Glenn will be here, and uh, Gui Chin, and JMO, and Jennifer have all been huge in rewriting that product, and we'll have some announcements for that coming up. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Tendency, it powers big professional associations. That's its niche. Um, and it does a lot of other stuff, but that's really what it's targeted to. All right, so if you're going to come out of here, what are the three rules of business? I'll call names, I'll do it. <laughs> Sell to profit, what else? Love what you do. And what was the other one? Recurring All right. Now, who in here, when I said recurring revenue, was like, oh, damn, I don't do that? Show of hands. All right. Anybody else? Oh, you live photographers in the back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So those are, what, those are the things you have to do. Um, one, you have to obsess about client profitability. And I mentioned that earlier, but I just want to mention that again. And, and the reason for that is that the clients, as much as they say they're going to love you, if you build them a commission Picasso and they're going to love the way the website, uh, I'll give you an example from my industry. A client will say, I want everything above the fold, right? We've all heard that. I want it above the fold. They want it to look like a TV channel, right? Well, have you ever gone to Google and you search for something and the results are like spam or porn and you're like frantically hitting the back button? I mean, has that happened to any of you guys? And it's, it's embarrassing. It's annoying. Right? Um, I'll tell you a funny story about a class I taught a while back. But here's the psychology. When you click, there is a subtle risk. There is a risk when you click. And if I am going to completely surrender to your control, when you scroll, what is your risk? Zero. That is why when you go to 37 Signals Basecamp sign up, that page goes on for like 50 miles because they have tested it. And one of the tragedies of web design is busy, cluttered layouts convert more. Um, and I'm not going to talk about web marketing concepts fully today, but it's things like that where you've got to. And so if the client says at the very beginning, I want it to look like Nike, then you have to go, well, that's great, but you're not Nike. Uh, it also helps to know your history. And then you can say, Nike didn't advertise for 20 years. They just did PR. And it turns out their big discovery, I don't know if you guys knew this, but chicks like to work out. Nobody knew this. Uh, nobody targeted female athletic shoes, and that was the niche that they owned. And then they expanded from there, and they did it by reaching out to track coaches. So when you look at Nike or you look at Apple, you gotta, your clients can't do that type of thing. Um, and you've got to make sure that your websites and your marketing materials are designed to sell uh, and also to make sure that your clients are. I, I already said that business plans are, are BS, and I also used to think that fluffy mission and vision statements were BS. And on this one, I was wildly wrong. You can literally look at the profitability of our company. And when we got down and we started having three focal points and we have a written vision and mission, that is when our profitability went up. And it is amazing if you, if you don't have a written mission and vision for your business, do it. I mean, really do it. And remember, vision for us, it's connect and organize the world's people and do good. And, and that a vision is a long-term thing. I mean, that should easily last me 20 years. A mission's a working document. That's the napkin. So your mission should change every five years. You should revisit it. But you're never going to get anywhere if you don't have a goal, if you don't have direction, right? And their direct correlation between the vision and mission for our company astounded me. Now, if you do have, like, a fluffy mission and vision, you know, I want to make the world perfect with beautiful bunnies and flowers and that's why you know that's not going to work all right but if you have something that is clear you'll know you'll know when your vision is working when one of your employees throws it back at you right i mean ours is you know connect and organize world's people do good and i'm i like forgiving people and there was a gentleman who'd done some things he probably shouldn't have done a few years back and but you know he got his marriage back together etc and i was going to 
invite him to one of our events and one of my other employees was like, well, it says right here, Ed, um, and, and we also have uh, values, et cetera, that, and, and our, our honor code is uh, a ship light does not lie, cheat, or steal, that's easy, nor tolerate those who do. Uh, for the Aggies in the room, you'll think that that's the Aggie code of honor. It's actually from West Point, uh, and the Aggies borrowed it from West Point, but it is very much relevant. All right, that's another takeaway. You're gonna have a written mission and vision, right? Definite takeaway, you've got to do that for me, people. Um, the next one, uh, customer-driven development. I don't care how clever and amazingly smart you think you are. If I, I lost probably $200,000 in the last four years because we thought we were gonna go in, go into this little uh, skunk works, develop this new product, and then release it, right? And we did that, and it was awesome. It was a great product. There was only one flaw. Nobody would pay for it. Oops. So what we should have done, develop a prototype, get somebody using it. And that's why you're hearing the developers talk about Scrum and agile development with these faster development cycles. Now for us, it wasn't a complete write-off because the basis of that became the new version of Tendency. Uh, that, that actually we'll be showing you some, not I won't, but the other guys will later on today. So it wasn't a complete loss, but you've got to get it in front of the customers. And so for us, uh, it is amazing how many times a client will say, I've got to have this field. If I don't have this field, the end of the world is here and California is going to drop off the continent. And then you say, um, okay, all right, uh, that mod's going to cost $1,000. And they're like, oh, no, I d I'll just write on a piece of paper. It's cool. And you're like, what? Wait a minute. Hold on. Wait, you're going to sacrifice California for one grand? Really? Um, so money is one of the best ways to prioritize things. It really is. So if you are running a profitable business, have your clients prioritize stuff with profit. Um, and, and because you can always cut back and you can identify those clients. Firing clients is another great way to get through a recession because you will find the clients which are the biggest pain in the ass and then and when you have the next employee attrition, you don't replace them and you have less work and your profit goes up. And that's, okay, here's another sacred cow. You know what we don't like saying as business owners? You know what happens when three people quit? Profit goes up, right? Why wouldn't it? How many people like that? How many people think I'm a jerk for saying that? <laughs> but it's true. I mean, it's very much true. That doesn't mean you're not gonna have to replace them. Uh, and, you, and you are, but you're probably gonna replace them with somebody else and they're gonna come in. But in, in the short term, it's gonna go up. That's why you see people who, who will do, uh, one of my competitors in Houston, at the time he had about 40 employees and so he just canceled healthcare for the entire company to shut it down. And my people were like, oh my God, he can't possibly do that. I mean, if he does that, he's not gonna be able to retain any good employees. And I said, well, actually he is. You know what he's gonna do? He's gonna save over $80,000 a year that my company pays for employee health care, right? He's gonna save that for the next three years. And then when the economy turns back around, he's gonna be like, oh, we introduced this great new benefit. Now we have health care. And everyone's gonna give him a round of applause, right? And, and so it's, it's not fair, and that goes back to the ethics thing. So I am not willing to do that personally, um, but that is one way that I've seen other people do it. For me, that, that violates some of our core ethics. All right, this one's specifically for Amy, and um, that's the woman right here. I'm calling her out. <laughs> if you cannot, if you cannot click and immediately show me your accounting and your banking, if you are not that directly in touch with it, you're screwed and your business will absolutely fail. You cannot trust an accountant, you cannot trust somebody else. In fact, I have three different accountants. I have, I have an office manager and then I have an accountant that comes in once a week and then I have a different accountant who does my taxes at the end of the year. And you know what? They all catch stuff that the other ones miss. They all catch stuff that the other ones miss. So you've gotta take full ownership of that. Now I see a lot of Macs in here and I'm a Mac user myself. I am fully aware that uh, QuickBooks doesn't run well on a Mac, so run Parallels and run the PC version of QuickBooks and Parallels on the Mac. If you're starting out, just go to FreshBooks or one of those where it's a little bit easier. So, um, so that's the first one on accounting. You've gotta be directly involved. That burned me in my first business. I was not directly involved in the accounting. Uh, I decided I was gonna be the behind the scenes technical guy, right? So my partner's out there and he's the sales guy. He's meeting all the clients, he's doing all this stuff and I'm staying up all night coding, having a blast. It was awesome. And then we're in merger talks to be bought out well, you know what? Nobody knew me. Nobody knew me at all. So he executed a buy-sell agreement. I'm cut out. 
because I don't have enough money to counter it. Then to add insult to injury, it, it, I never got paid anyway. Um, and that is how this company got named Shipple, by the way, because this time around, I was like, well, damn it, they're going to know who did this. <laughs> you know, boom, put the name on the wall, right? Um, and as it is right now, my business development team is, uh, they, they definitely handle most of the client contact. It's, it's amazing. And also at this point, we've got about, I can't, I don't know the exact employee count I should, but we're between 35 and 40 employees. Pretty much, if you want to screw up an account, get Ed involved. Um, it, is, it is one of the, and it's not that I'm screwing it up. It, what happens is a uh, deferential thing. So it, it really hurts your profit if you're interacting with them because what will happen is I'll, I'll, and I'll call somebody else. I'll talk to David and I'll say, hey, I like that shirt. And he's working on a project, right? Actually, I don't. It's kind of boring. It's white. But anyway, let's just say it was a cool shirt that David was wearing. <laughs> And, and so then, you know what that becomes when he goes back to the project manager? He goes back to the project manager becomes, well, Ed said that specifically I got 1,000 free white shirts. And then the project manager is like, man, that Ed guy, I never talked to him much. I've only been here six months. All right, I'm going to go ahead and do the 1,000 free shirts, right? And it destroys your profitability. So interestingly enough, uh, as you grow, one of the ways you can increase your profit is by having less direct interaction uh, with the clients because they will use your words against you with the others. Um, I actually have kind of settled into a buddy system. So when I'm meeting with a client, I make sure at least one other employee is there because that really cuts down on the, uh, the imagined conversations with Ed factor. But I'm telling you, they're incredibly expensive when the, those go down and, and what are you going to do? I mean, the employee is, is trying to do the best thing that they thought. Um, all right, next one. I, I did a proposal a long time ago and I found myself sitting in front of a group of venture capitalists and it was for this portal called GoHouston.com and it was going to be basically uh, somewhere between a Yelp and a Facebook for Houston, right? In fact, if you go to GoHouston.com now, it still goes to my site and et cetera, et cetera. And so they go through and they hit me with every single question and I know every single answer. And then um, it was actually Dennis Murphy here in town. I don't know if you guys know Mur Murphy Ventures. And so one of the guys at the end of the room says, what are you going to do about marketing? And I said, well, um, I don't know anything about marketing, so I'm going to hire a marketing manager. And um, if a venture capitalist ever asks you, what are you going to do about marketing, don't answer that way. <laughs> that is the wrong answer. Here's the right answer. Marketing and sales is absolutely a C-level responsibility. It is definitely part of my job. I'm going to need guidance, but I will personally take control and make sure that our marketing is on track to reach our target audiences. Because if you do not consider marketing your firm at a C level, and if there are any programmers in the room, all of us didn't want to do it. And, and by the way, I didn't know anything about marketing and advertising when I started the business. Uh, I just started reading when I was headed down, and I started reading every book I could, starting in Claude Hopkins, 1923, My Life in Advertising. And I learned everything I could about persuasion and about PR and about marketing. And I just, I've read more than most people with advertising degrees on advertising, because it's about selling, right? All right, how am I doing on time? Okay, because I don't, I don't have my, uh, I'm, I'm laptopless. Is, I, you'll sh oh, I, I get, the, I get the five sign in the back. Is, am I doing all right, everybody? Are we keeping up? Am I talking too fast? Everybody good? If you hate me, you can leave, because that leads into our next thing. Um, staffing. Uh, actually, I hit staffing, and then I'll, I'll get on to competition and haters. Um, Staffing. It is really hard to hire people, and there's. I, I worked with this woman years ago, and she had a. She was very bright, had a high school degree, and she was working at this big company that I worked at, and she was making about seventy-five thousand dollars. And this woman absolutely hated her job. She hated everything about her job. I think if she could have, she probably hated the carpet. This was a miserable person to work with, but you know what? She had complete golden handcuffs. Where? Could she possibly go to get anywhere near that compensation? And so I did a lot of research on compensation. And here's how it works. When your employee is happy, they will, if somebody says, what's your salary, you know, how much do you make? They're going to quote their salary plus their bonus plus their profit sharing, right? If they're mad, you know what they do? They'll not only quote their salary, they'll probably quote their net. And so what you don't want to do is give people golden handcuffs. So as a general rule, from a profitability perspective, what we try to do is pay people hopefully 110, 120% of market, and then the rest is variable. And what that lets me do is when I've got somebody who's ready to move on, they feel free to move on. 
but I'm still compensating people as best I possibly can. Now a corollary of that is if you are the business owner, you take prof when you take salaries serious. I mean, like you take it as a personal insult when somebody goes. I mean, you can't help it. I, I got in the elevator a couple of years ago, and uh, and one of my employees says, you know, I can't afford, you know, I, I can't afford to go to that restaurant, and it was like, you know, black eyed pea or something, and I couldn't help it. The words just come flying out of my mouth. I'm like, um, I know your salary. You absolutely can, and then. The rest of the nine flights down to the first floor were very awkward with the other employees and me sitting in the elevator. Um, but a lot of people in college, that's how they save money. They just tell everyone they don't have any money, right? But you can't help. You get insulted, and you feel like you, feel like you have failed. Um, and, and by the way, you, you feel like a failure a lot. Do you, I mean, example, do you know this, this little startup company, Google, is younger than us? Who are they? How dare they be bigger than us, right? And so I just, you look at that and you just feel like a failure. Uh, but then all the other people are looking at you from a completely different perspective. They're like, oh, that guy's just great and he's probably got this big ego and, and it's really upside down. So you have to manage those things. So I talked about compensation, but our entire management strategy is hire good people, train the hell out of them, let them run. And I promise you that is far more profitable. If your company stagnates, it's almost always because of a control freak leader, right? I mean, you gotta let go. And then when they really mess something up, you just gotta hold your tongue as best you possibly can. And again, like forgiveness, I can't give you a statistical sheet proving this improves your profitability, but I promise you it does. Uh, and it has served us very, very well. You would not believe the, uh, uh, Dries, you know that Drupal rap video? You know that I had absolutely nothing to do with that? All I know is I was in my office, somebody borrows my camera, and then half my employees are wandering back and forth for like four hours, and I'm like, you know, <laughs> Because Brian's an ex-videographer, and he's just like, oh, I gotta get 75 cuts. No, one more time from this angle. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm in my office, you know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking, Dries, you owe me like $10,000 in salary. <laughs> the hell? You know, and, th and then when it goes out, you know, uh, people don't know that it was us. Uh, but who's the target audience for that? I mean, I had nothing to do with it. But I will say that it has definitely helped with recruiting and staffing. But that was an accident. In other words, I held my tongue. I didn't direct, I held my tongue. I didn't say to do it, I just didn't say not to do it. And that is the only difference. Now sometimes people will borrow your hexacopter without knowing, run forward, crash into the ceiling and knock four props off. So there are other times when they fly, you know, it, it burns you both ways. Brian. <laughs> It turns out the settings on the little dip switches are important, just in case you're wondering. Um, all right, so we talked about customer driven, marketing and accounting, you must have those under control, they are C level. Competition and haters. Um, I actually get hate mail, I get hate email, I get it on Facebook, uh, and my employees are like, well, everybody loves us. No, 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 every time you close a deal, that means somebody else didn't get it. Um, we grow people, remember I said hire good people, train the hell out of them, let them run? You know what that does? It causes breakups and divorces because their spouse and their significant other doesn't grow at the same rate. So if that couple can't grow, you'll literally, I, 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 and I see it happening, and it's, I mean, what am I supposed to do, keep my people dumber, right? But it's, it's, it's this weird effect uh, that does happen, but you will be far more profitable if you hire good people, train the hell out of them, and let them run. So I buy, we spend, I don't know, what. Actually, I don't know, probably $4,000 a month on books or something like that. Um, one of the things is when you buy an employee a book, never ask them if they read it. Never ask them if they read it, and here's why. If you ask them if they read it, they're going to feel guilty about it, and they'll never ask you for another book. And you will stagnate that employee right there forever. So what you've got to do, again, is forgive, because that might not have been the right book for them. So we buy a ton of books for our people, but I don't ask if they read them, and that's why, because profit goes up when I don't do that. Um, which is very weird. Um, haters, you really can't, I mean, there's just, we used to work at Circuit City and they said 2% of the population is nuts. And so if, you know, 500 people come in the store every day, that means, what is that? Oh, I should have picked a smaller number. You know, 10, you know, but 10 complete certified nut jobs, right? And, and dealing with them is hard and you, all you can do is try to chase them out, but they kill profitability faster than anything else that I can think of. And they always come in super sweet and nice. You really can't tell, you can't see them. I've been, I've been trying to find the indicators on that. Haven't. If any of you guys have any tips, please share them with me after. So um, you have to avoid haters. Now, on the flip side of haters, you have competition. And there's a great book called Primal Branding. 
And you need to have believers and you need to have non-believers. So one of the things that's hurting my company right now is in the Houston market, we don't feel like we've got a really strong counter uh, agency that's kind of fighting against us. Part of that is we're friendly and we buy beer and we hang out with these people, you know. But it was a whole lot easier a couple years back when there was a company that, you know, had a stronger presence and, you know, they were, they were kind of trying to, trying to say they were better than us and back and forth. Believe it or not, that makes your brand a lot stronger. So don't discount that competition, the people hating on you, because uh, it actually helps your brand. It really does. Um, and if you're curious about that, check out the book Primal Branding. Um, it's excellent. All right, three, three more. Everybody still with me? All right, nobody's asleep in the back? Because I've got a mic, I can get really loud. You're yawning? Get, get the hell out, Jeremy. All right, this is all being recorded too. Can we edit that part? Is that? All right, the American environment. I, I mentioned earlier, um, we have a very, very unique environment in America. And it is, it is one that, it, it's really hard to make a profit right now for a lot of different reasons. I will tell you that that month, that month that they were fighting over the, the budget impasse, right? And, and I'm an independent, so the Republicans and, and the President and the Democrats were all fighting over that. You know how much my sales dropped that month? 70 grand. $70,000 drop in that one month because these idiots are fighting. And why? Because what's a businessman do in uncertainty? They freeze. They freeze. So some of these things are beyond your control. And they're up there thinking that they're, they're trying to win the 2012 election. I could care less. Just quit fighting like little children. Um, but this does affect your profitability. And in a recession, it's a very real factor. Um, now, the way you can counter that is in, in a recession, have more people who are coming in and, and hire more people on an hourly basis and, and keep the salary strong for the senior people to tell them what to do because then you get easier flex. Also, students tend to come and go. And that's a whole lot easier than having layoffs. Um, I did not have layoffs in 2001 when I um, was almost going out of business. In hindsight, I was wrong. I should have. I didn't have the courage to, and I've been very open and honest with my employees now that if I were in a similar situation, I would. Because who leaves first in a recession when they think the company's going downhill? Your best people. So then, then you're, you don't have your best people when you, I mean, you're not going to lose all of them because, I mean, you've got partners and things like that are going to stick around, but you're going to lose a lot of them. So uh, if, if you are seeing that happen, one of the ways that you can stay profitable in a recession is to make those hard decisions. Has anyone in this room who's fired somebody ever said, gosh, you know, I just should have waited another couple months before I fired them? Anyone? No? <laughs> the opposite. Every time it's the opposite. Um, now, when they go, I don't care how much it pains you. Uh, when they go, you overpay and you make sure you pay out all the PTO and you do e exceed every possible thing to make sure that they are taken care of on the exit. Because again, you're going to have enough natural haters and that extra $1,000 or whatever it is, uh, again, that's going to come back to your profitability. It's going to come back in the form of not having somebody sue you. It's going to come back as in not losing a referral or a client. I cannot tell you how many people have interviewed at our company, not gotten a job, gotten a job someplace else, and then called us up to do their website. It is amazing how often that happens. And so one of the most simple things you can do to remain profitable is be respectful to everybody. Um, I have people sitting in our lobby and they're just like, I'll walk by and I'll say, you know, can I get you anything? And one guy says to me the day, he goes, you realize you're the sixth person to ask me that. And we don't have a receptionist, but we do have a nice facade. We have like this little, you know, desk that looks like a receptionist would be there. Kind of just kind of fake legitimacy, right? But I don't believe in, I mean, that's overhead and maybe someday we will. But right now we just have this phone thing that we rotate around. And, and I said to him, I said, look, here, here's why. Um, I, I grew up in a big family where we, there were six kids and Roman Catholic family in the military. My dad was in the military. And, and the thing was, when you got down to one Coca-Cola in the fridge, you couldn't have it. You couldn't have it. You had, to, you had to leave it. Because if you had a guest come over, it needed to be there such that you could offer that to your guest. Uh, and that is still how, to this day, uh, we run the company. And that is why all of our employees, and I, it's not like I went around to them and said, you must, you know, because again, that doesn't work. I mean, if you work in the web design business, it's like, you know, it's, it, example. If you did a layout, and I take your layout, change two things, and post it up on one of my clients, how do you feel about that? You're mad, right? That's theft, I stole your layout. 
All right, now, Dries, if you write some really cool code, and I go, man, that code is cool, and I modify it a little bit, and I put it over here, to a programmer, are you insulted? I credited you, and I, and I complimented your code. I mean, you're not insulted at all, it's a compliment. So think about managing a shop like ours. The exact same behavior for the artist is an insult, and for the programmers is a show of respect. And so it's literally like herding cats and managing cats. So you really have to dig into it. And the best thing you can do, again, let the people kind of flow on their own. All right, last one. Innovation and invention. There was a book I read years ago called Digital Deflation. Oh, and this is the part where I'm telling you how to save our country, OK? <laughs> no pressure. All right, there's a book called Digital Deflation. And uh, I, need, I need a volunteer. I want to ask you about your cell phone. All right. Uh, I, Jeremy's on the floor there. I've already taken a cheap shot at you. So, OK, Jeremy, what kind of phone do you have? What, what version? You have, you have a four. Now, I, you got that phone when your old phone broke? It was stolen. OK, so you actually did get a replacement. Uh, anyone else in here, did they get it when, uh, did their old phone stop working? And then they got it? Or how many people in here just got a new phone because they wanted the cool new shiny? Okay, look, look around you. That is, that is three quarters of us. All right, and here's why you can't look at GDP and the other government figures is because what those things are looking at is like the number of cars off the assembly line. And, and they, they look at demand based on uh, production capacity and need. But innovation creates demand. Let me repeat that. Innovation creates demand. We want the cool, new, shiny. And that is how everybody in this room really can help America because our productivity measurements and all that, the GDP stuff, is wildly off. Don't, don't trust the government figures. I would trust Google Trends more than I would trust that stuff. But if you can create something that is innovative enough that people want to move up to it, to the next one, right? My 5D Canon broke, and so I had to get a 5D Mark II because I had video. No, I could have bought another 5D for like $1,000 less, bright new shiny. I had to have the new shiny, right? So innovation invention, that's how you're going to save America. All right, quick recap. What are the three rules of business? Profit. Sell to profit. Recurring revenue. Recurring revenue. Love what you do. Love what you do. All right, and what was the unexpected thing that's going to increase your profit more than you realize? No. Who let David in the room? No, I, 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 when, uh, there, were, there were two things I mentioned that uh, surprising to me increased profitability. Forgiveness. 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 That is so powerful, guys. And what was the other one? It starts with a written, a written mission and vision. Those are things that are soft that you don't think are going to relate to it, but they will change your bottom line, and they will get you not only through a recession, but they'll get you through a recession profitably. So with that... I will gratuitously ask for a round of applause. <laughs> All right. Uh, I, I saw the number two minutes in the back. Does anyone have any questions? Like across the board. Yes? So how do you reconcile innovation, creating demand, customer driven development? Innovation you have to create kind of a tunnel from a vacuum and then put it out there and see if it makes a prototype. All right, the question was, how do you reconcile customer-driven demand with innovation, which is kind of done in a vacuum? And the, the non sequitur there is that innovation actually isn't done in a vacuum. Uh, innovation is usually the cumulative thoughts of, like, like Darwin worked on it for 20 years, and then one day he, he wrote it out and was like, ta-da! But then it turned out, if you read his books, uh, not his books, but his journals, uh, he'd written the same thing like a year earlier but didn't understand the significance. So I would submit to you the exact opposite, that most innovation comes from interacting with the clients, and I strongly believe in crossing the streams. So that's why I do RC helicopters, that's why I do cameras, that's why I do, I learn to surf. So, all right, I'm getting the sign at the back that says stop. Uh, I will say one more thing. Thank you very much for joining us at this conference. It's a true honor to be able to serve you guys, so thank you.